This is a short presentation on the psychic interaction of negativity. Pathwork Lecture 202, which Pathwork Steps featured in the May 2019 uh, weekly or monthly newsletter and weekly meetings. Uh, this lecture is an invitation to go more deeply into the concepts of love as well as negativity in a way that is less dualistic, less simplistic, and more spiritually adult. And by that I mean that at some point during the lecture, now the guide talks about having to grow into a new understanding of concepts, of behavior, of uh, energy. And what it reminded me of is the quote from Corinthians, uh, in the Bible that says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. It is important not to get dualistic about studying the lectures. It does not make anybody inherently better than anyone else. This process is about looking at our personal interactions and our personal uh, judgments and blind spots to look at our personal contributions to negativity rather than uh, pointing fingers at other people. So to do that we have to go into deeper levels of complexity. It's hard work. Uh, it's not the thing that in that using that quote as an example it's not the thing that children do. So the invitation is is to do some hard work and that there are some great benefits from doing this hard work. Um, so as usual, I divided the uh, lecture into four sections. One is the primary guilt of not loving. And secondly is the secondary guilt, which is covering that up. The third is a very delicate aspect of victimhood, self-victimhood, as well as calling others victims. And the fourth is about how we choose love over cooperating or co-creating with negativity. In the first section of primary guilt, choosing not to love, um, it is difficult for people who are basically trying to build better lives and learn and, and be better people to rip open aspects of themselves where they, they chose not to love. And I use the phrase rip open because uh, one of the part of the work that we have to do is we have to go into areas where we've thought a certain way for decades. It's habitual. It we don't see it. We made up our mind, or we aligned ourselves years ago, and we've been running on that. It's worked great. Um, the one example I can think of, I try to think of humorous and silly and banal examples. Uh, because that's where you can find out how you lie to yourself. Uh, that I've always been healthy and I've never had digestive problems. And I said one day to someone, it can't be that. I was upset. I wasn't feeling well. I said, it can't be that because I have a cast iron stomach. It was one of those moments where even as I said it, I realized, number one, I've said it dozens and dozens of times. Number two, that's supposed to be a compliment that I have a stomach that can put up with anything. And thirdly, what had happened is I had changed, but I had kept the habit of saying things like that. I had changed in the sense that I now understand that it is not healthy to have a stomach that does not react to what is in it. It is not healthy or wonderful to have a cast iron stomach. It means that I would be immune from things that my body needs to notice. Things that could hurt me worse later on if I didn't literally vomit it back up because it, it, the stomach identified it as something that I, I shouldn't be ingesting. So this is an example where in one tiny moment, one little aha, I saw how I had been behaving in a certain way thinking that I, it made me wonderful and it was a great thing, realizing that it had passed its use-by date. This is not something that I want to continue to have 
uh, to hold as a positive. This is not something I want to continue happening. And therefore, I need to perhaps pay more attention to the smaller feelings that I have because I may have masked them. I may have overruled my body's signals because of my belief system that uh, different foods do not bother me. Again, that is a simplistic example, but that's the phrases, I love idioms, um, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where you can realize, wow, I've been saying one thing for years, saying one thing for years that I stopped believing in a long time ago, but I kept saying it. In other words, it's like a boat. When a boat moves in the water and you, you can't apply brakes, but when you attempt to reverse it, it's going to slide forward for a while before it, it stops. And that's what happens with belief systems. So in trying to find out where we have chosen not to love, we're going to have to uncover some places that have been, may have been covered up for a long time. So the guide suggests that we make a list. And that we look at where in our life we have chosen not to love. Now, immediately most of us, including me, go into defense, but. Uh, yes, I know, but. So one of the things that uh, I have found useful in doing this work is sometimes the word, uh, a word is a trigger. And the word here may be the word love. Love is very commonly thought of three ways. One, as strong feelings of affection and concern as for family and friends. Secondly, is romantic or sexual attraction. And third is an immense emotional attachment to a material thing, which represents a psychic uh, representation of a belief. And that's where we get in trouble, is when we say, I love my dog, I love my set of china, I love my home. We are probably saying something completely different. The word becomes shorthand. And in the shorthand, it loses its original or deeper spiritual meaning. So here, when I say the word love, I'm referring to love as feelings of kindness to other humans who share common traits and experiences. Now, kindness comes from kin, which comes from the idea that we're all in this together. So I'm going to leave out the animals and the plants and the ozone layer for, for this discussion. And only talk about our feelings and attitudes towards other human beings. That the love that the guy is talking about is a feeling of kindness and care based on the fact that they, like us, are dealing with common traits and common experiences. And also that they come from the same divine source, no matter what the externals look like, and that we all have a spiritual task to complete. This by itself is a whole lecture or a whole set of exercises. Uh, it's something that I use as a spiritual practice, and I'll give you two examples. Uh, once again, I like to be specific when applying the lectures because that's where our protest comes from. Yes, but. So I want to go with two simplistic ones. One is a bank robber and the other is a war-torn refugee situation, a group of people. So in terms of a bank robber, uh, people make life decisions. They make decisions to break the law. They make the decision to cheat. They make the decision to grab and run in ways that harm society and ha perhaps could harm me individually. Love in this context means an understanding that all of us do that. Some of us do this egregiously to an extreme degree, but all of us do it to a small degree. All of us cheat a little bit. All of us take a little bit more than our share. And all of us justify what we're doing. Just like a bank robber can say, well, society beat me up, so I just grab the money because I deserve it and I can't figure out what else to do, and it's not my fault. 
So the guide is suggesting that we look at love based on the common human traits and the common experiences. Where did I do this? Even if my example was tiny and hard to see, perhaps only if I saw it and no one else did, versus something that I can point to and discuss and prove that that person was obviously crazy or wrong or mean-spirited. Uh, now, when you turn to a global situation or a political conflict situation, what happens there is I'm too far removed. And it's too big, and it could be very, very painful. And the individuals aren't at fault, and I'm not at fault, and the government, not, nobody's at fault. And it's too big and complicated, and I can't handle it. There's a way of not reading about it, not paying attention to it, not considering what the very, very complex and lengthy uh, chain of effects and cause might be for those people where there's something I can do about it. What would be the loving thing to do if only to pray for their situation? So in both instances, one of the things that we can do is profoundly, deeply, and lovingly open our heart to the hardships of other people, to their difficulty in figuring out what to do, and to the reactions and acting out it may happen because they don't know what to do in a given situation except fight for their own survival. So this is the kind of love that is meant here. So I'm going to go back to the exercise to make a list of where in your life you have chosen not to love. Who doesn't deserve your love? Who is off the chart? What categories of human beings do not deserve your love? Sometimes it can be groups of human beings, mean-hearted people spiteful people, gossips, um, people who manufacture toxic chemicals. doesn't matter. People who manufacture toxic chemicals have families and they're trying to raise them and they're making decisions based upon their justifications, their understanding, their survival needs. So again, if I bring it home to me, I can love that person. I can hold that person in love by understanding the common traits and experiences that might have led them to do one thing and might have led me to do another. Uh, another aspect of not loving is to turn, you, turn away from it. To say, oh, that hurts or it bothers me or it's confusing to me. It is a way of turning away so that you don't have to address it. It is painful to hear about other people's suffering. It is traumatic to, to know some of the things that are going on in the world. We do need to turn away sometimes, but there's a difference between a momentary turning away and a systematic turning away. And so the invitation is to notice where you have systematically turned away from certain kinds of pain and suffering. And therefore you haven't practiced opening your heart to that person or group of people. Um, the second week, uh, we looked at secondary guilt. Now there's a phrase that's very popular lately, which is that it's not the crime, it's the cover up. And in American legal law, that is a legal principle that you technically you can break a law. The breaking of the law is not in itself a crime. The crime is a crime, but not the actual breaking of a law more complicated, but covering it up can be a worse offense than the actual crime you committed. So our secondary guilt is in covering up the crime by specifically blaming others for our choice not to love. So the guide suggests that we review the list that we made of the people that we don't love or don't have time for or just can't understand and haven't bothered to think about. And then we say out loud to each person on that list, I do not want to give you anything, but I demand that you give me everything. If you do not, I will punish you. Now those words can sound a little abstract, so I'm going to take these two little examples that I came up with and apply that phrase to them. 
to the bank robber. I do not want to give you anything. I don't want to give you any latitude. I don't want to hear your justifications or excuses. I don't want to see you as a human being. I just want to judge you as a criminal. But I demand that you give me everything. I demand that you hold me in respect as a law-abiding member of society, that you do not challenge my rules or my laws or my sentencing guidelines. If you do not do this, if you do not accept your guilt and go where I tell you to go as a social member of society, I will punish you. So if you rebel against your sentence, if you rebel against prison conditions that I have supported as a citizen, I will not. I will punish you further. So that sometimes the punishment for rebellion in the prison system is worse than the actual punishment that sent you to the prison system. So again, I'm gonna say this and I invite you to hear this about a bank robber. I do not want to give you anything, but I demand that you give me everything. If you do not, I will punish you. Now let's take this to the, let's say refugees in a tent city situation. That's a very large, complex series of cause and effect. It, it could take centuries to build that situation. It could take centuries to unbuild that situation. But in the moment of my not being willing to love them for simply being human beings, if I don't give them anything, I don't give them the right to be human, to cry and protest. But I demand that I continue my own way without being disturbed by their plight. And then if they don't act out the way I think they should act out, I will punish them by withholding funds, by not supporting refugee efforts, by not giving to charity, because I don't think they're deserving. As I think they're contributing to their situation. So again, think in terms of a refugee population and hear this phrase, I do not want to give you anything, but I demand that you give me everything. If you do not, I will punish you. So as you can see, it can be very difficult to find the grain of truth in our negative attitude towards people that are not in our lives, are not part of our family and friendship, our inner circle, we don't interact with them personally, it's very, very distant. But this lecture is about the psychic interaction of negativity. The place where my negativity in my home alone leaks out into the world. Where I interact with the human race, with the world of spirit, by putting out negativity and claiming I'm not doing that. So the invitation here is to stop or to reduce, can't stop, but we can reduce by acknowledging our negativity, our blaming, our refusal to love. Um, the other thing is uh, that negativity will come into a justification place, a place where yes, but, and negativity says, All right, I lost my place. I had this all lined up. Negativity says, you're right. We shouldn't do that. We're going to get hurt. They're going to take something from us if we love them. So it's a good thing to cover up and not love. And we are vulnerable to that because we've made the decision not to love. And so negativity strengthens our resolve. Because how can you argue with that? That's actually your, what you're doing is you're saying, I don't want to love, I don't want to help, I don't want to open my heart to you. And I have justification for not doing so. One of the things that enters into the cover-up is duality. Duality is sprinkled throughout the lectures. It's, uh, once you become sensitive to duality, it's everywhere. It's just like negativity. When you become sensitive to negativity, it's everywhere. It's one of the reasons people don't like being sensitivity, sensitive to negativity because then it just feels overwhelming. But I'm gonna flip back to my original point, and that is that 
as adults, we need to manage the complexity of the world. We need to be aware of and sensitive to both the positive and the negative. And if we have to turn away, we need to remember to turn back so that we don't turn it off so that it becomes numb and we never see it anymore. It is important to continue to be aware of reality. Um, so in the bad, good judgment, uh, we, it gives us permission to turn off the voices of certain people with plates of certain you know, groups of, of human beings. And then we come to one, week three, which is victimhood. Victimhood is a very sensitive topic. Uh, every time I discuss victimhood, I, uh, I make a caveat. And that is that blaming the victim is participating in victimhood. This work is about finding the place in us that likes being a victim and holds on to that position. It is not about pointing at other people because that's, as you heard in the first part about cover-up, the second part about cover-up, that's about trying to justify uh, our, our thinking processes. This is about not justifying our thinking process, but about being willing to be vulnerable and admit where there's a convenience here for us. So, talking about victimhood, where we claim that we are victims and when we are victims, another person must be responsible. So in that, we deny ourselves responsibility for having co-created situations and blame the other, which is very convenient. So let's look at co-creation. Um, Americans have a mythology about uh, two families, the Hatfields and the McCoys. My family comes from the South, so this is a reference that I've heard all my life. So you have the Hatfield family and the McCoy family, which every society has at some point. And they started fighting generations ago. And even if you can remember the inciting incident, it's just gotten accelerated. It's just, right now it's only a matter of justification. You're bad, I'm good, I'm bad, you're good. Oh, I'm bad, I'm good, you're bad. To stop the escalation, to stop the feud, Somebody's got to back off. Because you can't go back in history and erase the inciting incident. And you can't rebalance all the incidents from that point on because there is emotional attachment to it. There are subjective judgments attached to it. This is no longer something that can be settled by court case. This is about feelings. This is about perceptions. This is about value systems that don't match. So when we, have, we are in a feud, when we are in disagreement with someone who does not agree with us, one of the things we do is we go into victimhood. You're too harsh, you're too objective or subjective, you're too intellectual or too feeling, you're too hasty or too slow. But however we're phrasing it, we're blaming the other and we're saying that we have less guilt than they do. Anytime we feel we have less guilt than the other, this is a place where we are giving ourselves an escape key. Once again, we are not looking at the objective situation about who's right and who's wrong. This work is personal work, where we find out where we are wrong and we address that before we go and address the actual real world implications or repercussions. So when you, come, uh, when you come out of this, it's not my fault, uh, you're, you're to this, you're to that, and you look at your co-creation, you have to ask yourself some difficult questions. How did I begin to participate in this? Where did I want to participate in this? Where did I see this as an avenue where I could push for certain things? and I lost the battle, so now I'm a wronged person. There is a co-creation quality in any negative interaction. So um, as an example, uh, 
if I'm walking down the street and I come across a very disagreeable person uh, and I decide I'm going to stand my ground, I'm going to argue this out and tell them to move, um, before I go into that, before I go into the right or wrong of that, the spiritual work is to say what's going on here and to recognize the joy, the joy I feel in being righteous, you're wrong and I'm right. Where I want to be master in the situation and tell someone to go sit down. Where I don't want to feel like a victim by crossing the street and going on my way. Now, that does not make me a victim, but the, uh, the idea is that that would make me a victim prevents me from making that choice. When actually, sometimes that's the most appropriate thing to do, to walk away. So when we do not walk away from situations, the question that is being invited here is why? Why would you not walk away? Now, I'm sure you can hear the but. But that's my job and I have to do my job. Um, I have a volunteer situation that I'm involved with. And one day I got a just like the cast iron stomach situation, I got an aha, and I realized that some of the conflict I felt and that was in, spilling over into my words and my attitude, that some of the conflict I felt was about being tired of being pushed around, about wanting to stand up for myself, about wanting to get my view out into the world. Now, Perhaps you can hear from these three, this has nothing to do with a given decision in a volunteer group. But I was piling that on to these decisions. Instead of asking myself, is this the appropriate time or place? This is not my group, this is a volunteer group. Where do I need to be more amenable to the opinions and values of others? Once again, that can feel like a retreat and I can choose to feel like a victim but it's not. Now, nobody can tell me whether it is or not. I am saying it's not. This was my personal realization. And that's why this work is all about personal realization, not about how to fix the problem, not about what you should tell your boss or your friend or your family member, or when you should cross the street. The process of Patrick is about finding the truth within yourself, finding the lies you tell yourself, finding the cover-ups you, 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 you use to mask your negativity, to find the place where you are not willing to love. That's the process. So uh, as part of this, the invitation uh, that I turn into exercises in the newsletters is that if this is a co-creation and you're engaged with it, then you are actually attracting the other person because you're offering to fight with them. And in the co-creation, you are both bound to each other. Now, these are individual choices, and yet you are offering to engage. I'd suggest that you consider setting each other free by taking actions on your part. And once again, this is done personally. To admit your unfair demands. To find the greater truth where you co-created the negative situation, where you egged yourself on, where you justified, where you built a case for why you had to behave in a certain way. And to take responsibility for your part and to also admit your part in generating negativity. Now this leads into the concept of negative pleasure, which is discussed in Catholic Lecture 140. Uh, but at some point, it leads into everything, so I have to limit the discussion. But the last thing that the guide says is that honesty is a form of love. To be transparent personally and honest personally is a form of love. And it may be difficult to manifest that in terms of how shall I be honest? How shall I be transparent? But it is critical to first have the desire to be honest and transparent. Very often we rush into the manifestation before we've cleaned up our motives. 
So this is about looking at our own personal motives and where we engage in energetic negativity. Uh, and the last section is the more fun part. It's about choosing love. Um, and this is where the guide says, I'm going to repeat this, the quote from Corinthians that says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. The guide suggests that despite the fact that certain attitudes and defenses and personality traits may have gotten us to this point today, they may hold us back at this point. In other words, the um, attitudes that were once useful may become destructive and limiting as we engage on a higher and higher spiritual plane. So in other words, the toys of our childhood were great when we were five years old. But if we carry our teddy bear around in our hand, it's going to limit our ability to talk to other adults who may not understand the psychic meaning of the teddy, the teddy bear that we're holding. That's a silly example. But a lot of us grew up uh, with certain attitudes, uh, pugnaciousness, uh, quick to speak, uh, witty, uh, fast to find the argument, fast to find the, the flaw in what was being done or what was being said. And that may have given us uh, respect, may have gotten us respect, it may have elevated our status in a group of individuals. It may have gotten certain jobs, which got us certain finances, which got us to a certain place in life. What the guide is suggesting is to examine whether that particular trait, as useful at it as it was throughout your childhood and adulthood, is it something that needs to be carried forward? Is it time to let it go? So this is a place where we have a certain momentum going that turns into inertia, where we're already moving, so we don't think we have to do anything, but that means we can continue to move in that same direction unless we put some pressure on to change. And that's where the work is. The work is in putting pressure on ourselves to re-examine, re-align, re, uh, redefine what we are doing spiritually, energetically, personally, and take action about it. So, um, I see this as um, uh, similar to, once again, practical examples. When you moved from elementary school to high school, you had to change your attitudes. You weren't in the same classroom with only one teacher. You were moving around all day long, with different classes, different groups of students, different teachers. Certain attitudes had to change. You couldn't rely on the attitudes, all of the attitudes that you had in elementary school. You had to change. Same thing when you go from high school if you went to college. Or if you went from high school to a job. The labor market is not high school. And attitudes have to change. Things that were fine in high school are not necessarily fine in the labor market. If you were a person who started out in the labor market, and then moved into management or leadership, attitudes have to change. You have to realize a larger picture and different perspectives, and you may have to grade different needs and different perspectives, different outlooks, and different outcomes together. So this is, uh, these are real world examples that you have, most of you have already experienced. And the suggestion is that as we learn things, as we move through new spiritual developmental layers, we have to do the same thing. And they're simply not as obvious, they're somewhat abstract. So the only person who can recognize them, the only person who can actually do them, is ourselves. It's a very personal process. Um, so some questions that you could ask is what was your old response or why was your old response or conditioned reflex that you had that worked? Why is it inappropriate for a new situation? Now, you would ask this when you are, find conflict in an area that you hadn't found conflict in before. In other words, something changed. 
And the truth can be that what changed was your inability to change. That before you were adaptable and now you're firm. And as life changes, you're not able to adapt and change with it. So it is useful to look at why a certain attitude was appropriate and beneficial and why it may need to change for who you are today and what you are trying to do today. What is the new response based upon? Um, what was the process like the last time you changed? And what would the process today look like if you changed? Um, and the guide ends with the idea that love is key here, which is why I looked at the beginning on making sure that we have a generous concept of love, that we're not using love to uh, as shorthand for romance and attraction, for intense attachment, or for affection and concern. That when we say love is the key, we're talking about a deep spiritual willingness to accept the reality of others while still wanting to change what is happening in the world, how it happened, and what will happen next. Both can coexist in the same space. So again, the guide suggests that if you want to look for negativity, some of us may not be experiencing profound negativity in life. So look for the areas that are uncomfortable. Look for where you don't want to go. Oh, I don't want to talk to him again. I just, every time I talk to him, I get upset. All right, that's a place to work. I don't like going in a certain neighborhood. It makes me feel inferior. They're all dressed much nicer and I don't have the money to eat in restaurants like. Look at where you are putting a creating a them and us, me and you situation there. Find any area of your life where you are uncomfortable. Start small. Don't look at wars and global conflicts. Those are really complicated. Find the small places in you where you have closed up your heart and see if you can create an opening. There. See if you can open for real love with boundaries with defenses so that you're not misused or abused. There's no intent to do that here. And when we do that, we are more able to see the psychic negativity that we produce and that we cooperate with, and that's when we can adjust it. And the key word is not to dualistically stop it or make it go away, but to also offer to ourselves love was negative. It was mean-spirited. I would like not to be mean-spirited. I would like to be more loving. What would that take? We have to look at it first before we can consider what we would change that would soften that and allow the love to flow so that the neg negativity is not as present and eventually is pushed aside. So thank you for listening to the presentation. I hope you read the lecture. It is far more eloquent than I could ever be. Um, thanks for listening.